Welcome to the Talent Equation Podcast. If you are passionate about helping young people to unleash their potential and want to find ways to do that better, then you've come to the right place. The Talent Equation Podcast seeks to answer the important questions facing parents, coaches, and talent developers as they try to help young people become the best they can be. This is a series of unscripted, unpolished conversations between people at the razor's edge of the talent community who are prepared to share their knowledge, experiences, and challenges in an effort to help others get better faster. Listen, reflect, and don't forget to join the discussion at thetalentequation.co.uk. Enjoy the show. I'm really excited today because having uh, having bumped into him recently at the um, UK Coaching Conference where he was provided with a very fetching coach developer hat as part of a fun activity we were doing in the keynote. Um, I have, I'm have i delighted to welcome Professor Richard Cheatham to the um, uh, to the Talent Equation podcast. Richard, welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stu. Uh, let's not talk about the hat incident for too long. <laughs> but uh, anyway. Yeah, we well, there, there's we evidence the on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We did win the game, that's true. So that's maybe, right, yeah. maybe that's what, what, what it was all about. Yeah. Um, but um, no, y- y- um, I genuinely mean that when I say I'm excited. It's um, you're long overdue on the podcast. You've been you've been on my uh, hit list, if you like, to to come on. But it's been entirely my fault that I haven't reached out before now to come on. So I was really glad that we could bump into each other and have a have a chat and reacquaint. And then uh, from that, um, this conversation uh, has has come about um, as a starting point. I, in the world of coach development, you are very, very well known, uh, and most people will know of the sort of stuff you do, um, and probably know of you on Twitter as uh, as Two Wheel Prof. Um, but uh, there may be some people who are listening who who've not come across you so far. So I wonder if you could just give us a bit about your backstory and how you do what you do, and you and what you're doing day to day as well. Sure. I mean, uh, I suppose it's a question of how far I go back, but when I finished. Um playing I, I went into to coaching and very much felt that I wanted to coach how I would like to be coached um, and uh, after spending three years uh, in New Zealand I came back and started at university in 2005 so that's a long time ago and but in that time it's given me a, a real opportunity to develop and have that autonomy to to find out where not only my career goes but also where the the needs in coaching and coach development and player development have taken me really. So I started the University of Winchester in 2005, um, coach uh, developer for the Rugby Football Union. I also work for World Cycling in Switzerland on their sport director program, um, which is one of the really uh, great learning uh, to, uh, environments I've had before. Um, different cultures, different languages in a, in a group in front of me and how can I put their message across to them and that was a real huge learning curve um, and so in addition to my work here as a, a senior fellow in sports coaching, uh, coach developer, coach educator, I'm doing quite a bit of research on play um, as an integral part of coaching. I've just finished a physical literacy um, and literacy project within an infant school where we try and uh, link the subject of literacy with physical literacy. The identification really was that there is um, a need to to really spend a lot of time with young children on developing those fundamental movement skills. How can we enhance that? And so we developed this project called Moving Stories, where we teach movement through a story. So, for example, the Pirate Cruncher which is a great story if you've got uh, children under seven. I've read that, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah <laughs> or actually, no, it's probably under, under 53 because I'm 53, <laughs> so it's, I enjoy that. Um, so we, we have footwork like pirates. We move on stormy seas. We, we get the kind of mirroring and reaction time, which I call it as the coach, but the children get the copying of a parrot. So I move, they move. So we've got those uh, skills being delivered in a, in a different way. Um, in a more implicit coaching, the children get to learn the story of the book and they get those movement skills enhanced. I'm excited about that project. Really, that's gone really well. Um, 
and I think I've shared it on a few of the conferences I've delivered at, uh, certainly up in Edinburgh. And this weekend, I'm going back to my roots with Hampshire Rugby um, and an hour of learning about learning, which I think has been a real opener for me in terms of, you know, how can we get the best out of ourselves in terms of de- developing sessions where people can really um, show deeper level of learning and have a greater empathy with those people in front of us so we can think about learning strategies. We've spoken historically about learning styles, which I think is obviously evident, but we don't have one learning style. We, I, I think that to develop people need to look at learning strategies. So that's kind of a very whistle-stop tour through my, my backstory. Um, and... In terms of, I mean, it's a lot of fascinating stuff that we can dig into because I think there's a lot of um, a lot of interesting uh, interesting space. I'm very interested in going into the physical literacy stuff. Um, just as a jump off point, though, just where you finished there around the idea of learning strategies, that's that's something that's piqued my interest immediately. So, what sort of things will you be talking about with the the lucky folk in Hampshire? So, I've when we look at learning styles, it's very common for people to think, oh, I learn in this way. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm a kinesthetic learner, an audio learner, visual learner. And what people really need to be more aware of is that those are ways of learning, but we don't have a bias. Uh, we, we, yes, we may find that that's easier to learn visually. We find it's easier to learn by doing, for example, making a cake. But we don't, as individuals, have one particular um, bias. What I'm keen for people to, to work on this more, this uh, this Sunday is what ways can we uh, enhance learning and what does learning look like? So this Sunday we're going to be playing double, which you've seen on the on, on, on Twitter. And if you're not quite sure what double is, it's it's a it's a round card with lots of images. When you compare two cards, there's always one image which is the same. There's only one image, and it's the first person to identify that. Now I've moved that around and, and used that for um, exploratory questions. So one of them is uh, would be a dinosaur. So I get groups to talk to each other uh, um, about uh, what would a dinosaur represent as a question. And I say, well, if you could change anything from your past, what would it be? What are your old habits that you've changed? And what it shows straight away is that um, that through collaborative learning, we can find out a lot more about one another. Uh, we can show that in a group of people they've got different ways of using the same game so we've all got that element of creativity um i always make sure that uh, everybody in the room is active straight away so sunday i hope the coaches are ready to be active they're not going to be standing watching the clipboards for too long <laughs> um and so it's going to go through the 15 um pillars that i've put down as what a learning environment looks like uh, I'm interested in, um, I'm interested in, in his, I mean, double, by the way, I mean, to anybody out there, and I've got no vested interest in double, apart from maybe I'll put some kind of a, a link on the website, an affiliate link or something. But um, as a game, what a fantastic game. Um, I played it with my kids and it is an absolute whale of a time. And the greatest thing about it is it really almost doesn't seem to matter what age you are. So mm. like, I've got a daughter who's uh, just about to become seven and I've got a son who's um, ten and a half and of course they're at different levels but it's actually quite interesting how you can you can win um, in different ways what, what I also really like about the game just without wanting to get fixated on it is there's different ways of playing it um, like there's a there's a version where for example if you if you if you win you get or if you win a card you can give it to somebody else which is quite brutal but what's very interesting is to notice how uh, different people seem to be better at one format versus the other, which I think is interesting, linking, linking back to your point about learning strategies. Um, on, on, on either case, it's really interesting the different approaches they're taking in terms of trying to work out what, you know, what, what they can see. So, yeah, anyway, highly recommend the game. Fantastic game. Brilliant fun for you know, long journeys or whatever it might be, you know, just to spend a kind of lazy afternoon with the kids. We quite often play it after Sunday dinner. Um, we have like a bit of a games night after Sunday dinner. Oh, brilliant. And, uh, yeah, Double comes out and a few other games come out. Um, so um yeah no anyway but coming back be, to the point, be careful though because we are playing and some people are skeptical about the value of play oh well, well we're gonna get, you know we're getting on that that uh, that rabbit hole a bit later <laughs> um yeah but yeah i mean I'm, i i i don't you know i'm an advocate for the game i don't i'm not sponsored by them or anything at all i mean so i don't think that's a it's a commercial but 
I was at um, Wasps Academy coaches meeting last week and it was just a lovely way for the coaches to talk to one another. You know, so you look at the card, what question would you ask of somebody you're going to spend all, all season with and the high pressure environments that help to just peel back a layer about that person. What, what are they like? And, um, but they, the important thing was they chose the questions. So mm-hmm. I'm looking at a card now. It's got a car on there. What was your first car? There might be something like, how far have you traveled? Mm-hmm. The interpretation of that image already shows me and shows the coaches in front of me when they say, oh, I'm not very creative. Well, you've just, you've just shown you can think differently about the same problem, the yeah. same challenge. Love it. Um, and you get some very emotive answers. I mean, there was an anchor, which for me, you know, is um, when you find time in your life to stop. Mm. Uh, and uh, one of those, the coaches up in Edinburgh said to me, um, you know, what is your anchor? What's that safe place that grounds you? Mm. And I think that's a great question for young athletes. You know, where do they feel secure? Um, who, who makes them feel secure? Um, another coach, uh, uh, Matt Williams, I'm sure you won't mind me mentioning his name, yeah. but says, you know, what floats your boat? <laughs> so, so already from that, what you've got is that um, lovely diversity of, of uh, interpretations of the same image. And that's where I think coaching is going, is about thinking very differently and allowing a platform where people can think differently um, and saying, look, it's okay. It's okay, that's a good idea. I hadn't thought of that. I love that. I actually love using the images on the double cards as a means by which to elicit, elicit a question. That's a really fascinating idea. I've never really considered that before, but that's right. There you go. Um, I've already stolen that. I'm, going to, I'm taking that one away. Um, well, I just say it's never um, a steal. It's always a, it's always a great compliment if somebody thinks that an idea which we've developed is worthy enough for them to take on. So, brilliant. You know, you you go for it and uh, just tell me what uh, what game you've made up from that or what answers. <laughs> what what I like is um uh yeah I mean like you say I mean often it's conversations like this where these kind of creative ideas emerge and um I'm already thinking about what I could use the you know the character on each card as a double character isn't there which is this kind mm. of random random what that could be that would almost be like a wild card question where you could kind of ask anything yeah that's right and and you know you could you can allow it to flow whichever direction it goes you don't have to you know it doesn't be performance pace I mean going back to Matt again he said um, you know, you ask a group of rugby players a question. So Nick Kennedy popped in last week and I chat to him and, you know, he said, you don't want rugby players shouldn't feel they give you rugby answers. Mm. He asked me to ask the question based upon what is a bit more holistic view of me that I can have a view as a player. Mm. Mm. You know, um, yeah. So that's a very good way to work with young players and, and adults as well. Brilliant. Um, I remember actually, funnily enough, I was doing I in in rugby doing a session recently with the, with the Queens Academy, and we we covered similar ground, not in the same way, where we actually were asking ourselves the questions around how good we were at creating connections with the players, mm. um, even even things as simple as you know getting to know their names as a starting point and yeah. strategies to do that just so that we can build the connection and all that sort of stuff. And there was a lot of, you know, they're, they're, they're constrained by time because they don't see them that regularly. And the time they have with them is relatively, is relatively constrained. So they feel like they've got to get into, into activity quickly. But we, we sort of came back to the idea that actually spending some time at the very start building connection pays dividends later on so it has a real value even though it doesn't necessarily feel like um you know you're you're using the time effectively because you're you know you're you're not getting active really quickly and then they came up with all sorts of other strategies around how they could use breaks as a means by which to create connection and understand more about players as opposed to just literally letting that space just to be kind of you know, kind of dead space actually mm. do be more active in it. So quite an interesting um, idea and uh, or an interesting theme that seems to be emerging in the, in the sport. Well, I mean, that, that's, that, that's really exactly what this game kind of uh, develops that that connection mm. um, on whatever level it starts with. And there's a book called the power of moments. And I remember just reading it on an airplane. It was talking about collisions. Mm. Uh, the collisions not, you know, contact collision where two people bump into each other and happen to have something in common. Mm. So I was talking to the person that sat next to me in the airplane, talking about the book, mentioning collisions. We happen to have the same favorite film, <laughs> completely random. Now um, you've got a group of players um, and you just, you know, talk and talk through this, through the double cards. What have you got in common? When, when's your collision? 
mm-hmm. and uh, you know it was very very interesting what collisions uh, came up you know uh, fear of spiders same place on holiday um, live next door to the same person you know as uh, um, just very 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 broad and what that does is that just creates conversation and I think you know you talked about the value of those activities just now and we must really value those because I, I said to the guys, I said, I said, do you want me to stop? You know, I've been doing it for half an hour. And, I, and then I said, oh, hang on a minute, would you stop it? Mm-hmm. And they said, no, no, we, we just want to talk to something different. We don't want to stop it. And I thought, that's great because, you know, it's, I always have the phrase and some coaches who I've worked with have heard it before, you know, having a great time until the coach came along. <laughs> yeah. You know, and the coach threw in some order and structure when in fact it was flowing naturally, working really well intuitively which is one of the things i'm talking about on sunday about intuition let's just let it flow let's see where it's going to go to um so that, that that's an interesting subject just by the way uh, power of moments is on my bedside at the moment i'm halfway through um okay. fantastic already like it's you know kind of unput downable uh, what i love about that one of the things i've really taken away is the whole thing about experiences mm. and how we can make really brilliant unique experiences one of the the stories that it's Chip and Dan Heath, isn't it? One of the stories that they tell about that is about the 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 is it the magic the magic hotel? I can't remember the name of it. Where you can there's a popsicle hotline, for example. So it's like not, not the best hotel in the world. In fact, you know, kind of from from a facilities perspective, it's not like the most gleaming, shining hotel. There's much more high end hotels, but the experience you have there is unique and so unique it makes it one of the most popular hotels, certainly in in that part of America. And I I took away from that. I thought, right, what is my What's going to be my popsicle hotline? What right. is it that I'm going to do uh, that's going to mean that when they come and have the experience that they've got something? And um, I, I don't know. I, I'm still still working on it, to be honest. I still need to come up with my, uh, my thing. It doesn't have to be the same thing every time, but just every session, I feel like it needs to have a popsicle hotline in it somewhere. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah that, I mean, that's very interesting. You mentioned that, that, that hotel because, uh, you know, I talk about, I mean, you can, talk about a variety of things i mean on the the learning environments what's memorable about it what do people take away what will people always refer back to mm. uh you know and uh, i know ross Learnshaw sort of you know kind of winces when i tell my dad jokes at the beginning of presentations but <laughs> it's almost becoming an expectation now is that how do you start your session with and the double cards is yeah for example isn't is something that people can take away and when we're a coach and when we're a coach educator what are people walking away with um what's memorable we've tried balloons we've tried double cards we've tried jokes we tried obviously particular activities but you're right it's that what is that uh popsicle moment what is that what is that experience yeah. um so i i think when we concentrate on learning and we we, we say what's the most mem-, you know go back and tell me something that you can remember and they'll link to something that can be completely random but it's how they remembered it i'm interested in mm. that's what i'm really in- interested in um, and I have a lovely video of um, my daughter doing it very proudly with a plastic microphone, singing the alphabet A to Z. And we were excited parents and thinking she knows the alphabet back to front. Fantastic. Pointless. <laughs> because that does, you know, it's just regurgitating a series of letters. When you go to school, they have context. It takes certain letters out. They build words. Mm. I, that taught me a lot about coaching is a lot about actually celebrating something I could do in my work and thinking I looked on that. ABC song very differently and so I think how do we make those learning experiences memorable what strategies do we use and certainly on Sunday as the workshops let, let's let's do something let's not stand and watch let's get involved um, and one of the challenges with the 100 rugby coaches they've probably got knees and backs and shoulders that are you know um, not the same condition when they started playing yeah. so um, I hope they don't uh, not turn up on Sunday because it's not about running around. It's actually about being active learners. Mm. So it's about modeling, I suppose, what you would want in a session in the sense of what you don't want is people who are passively listening. You want people who are actively participating in the learning Mm. process. Absolutely. What does it look like? And also, what does it feel like? Mm. So I've done the sessions on play. I mean, I mentioned this before and apologies if people have heard the story, but it was just hilarious going to a skeptical group of coaches um, at 9.30 in the morning for the start of a workshop. And I've written about this in, in um, a, a book on play, which is coming out in the new year with some other um, 
colleagues and at 9.30 they were sceptical. 11 o'clock they're running around the room pretending to be butterflies. <laughs> um, but it, it was their game. And, yeah. and it was their, the game they'd made up. And I, I want to know what that experience was like because if you feel that experience, imagine what those you coach will feel like. Yeah. And I talk about continuation desire. Would I want to come back next week? Would I want to come back next week to that sport, to that experience, and to that coach? Um, so so by at, getting coaches to experience what they're asking others to do, it deepens that level of empathy or understanding they have with that group. Because if it, if it resonates for a group of adults who've started with a degree of, like you say, scepticism or or you know they're slightly fearful towards you know acting in this way and by the end of it they've experienced that sort of sensation of freedom and joy and Mm. and and connection that they're creating through play that then resonates far stronger with them in terms of then wanting to try and provide a similar experience for others yes absolutely you know i don't believe you can be a bit of a sweet statement here, really, but I think to be a good children's coach, you have to have that childlike element in you. That, that that can't be dormant. You've got to reach into their world and find out what's happening in their world. What are the what what makes them laugh? What connections? What implicit coaching um, techniques could you use? Then you know, refer to to dinosaurs or superheroes. Um, those kind of things. That's why the the pirates was a was a good um, link to developing those literacy physical literacy skills. Um, but also I think what, what I've discovered as well, um, just Brenny Brown's book, Daring Greatly is about this fear of vulnerability, you know, with a new idea, with a group comes that vulnerability, that fear, you know, I feel vulnerable because if it goes wrong, I think this is going to happen. Um, but you know, I, I think it's about encouraging coaches to try things. Um, not significant changes, just a small thing, see how it works, and then build on that. So, one of the things that I definitely want to circle back to the play stuff because it's an area of complete fascination for me. But I'm um, I'm interested in um, w- what you said there around uh, how, or it seems to me anyway that so a lot of the focus that you're providing is like what you might call. Um, I think this is a bit, by the way, that is completely missing in quite a lot of formal coach education. I know we've we've spoken about this in the past, I think, um, which is we don't tend to focus on it from the perspective of the participant and what it is that they want and, and need um, in, in the sense of we, we sort of feel that if we were to meet the needs of children in their sports experience and create something that is... Um, aligned to what they would do them or close more closely aligned to what they would do themselves that that's somehow frivolous and 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 ha- has less value um and i think what you're trying to do is to reframe that from the perspective of um you know consider their experience and and certainly uh, one of the things that i've been trying to challenge the whole of the coaching sector on really is to say that should be our starting point and then if we can then find clever means by which to through that kind of great joyous experience also provide opportunities for them to learn find out new things about themselves experience new um you know new approaches to solving problems that might be coming at them that i've always felt that that that's kind of the almost like the the ideal sweet spot that we want to be trying to trying to get towards so it sounds to me like you're almost doing uh, you're you're focusing on that that area of of the kind of coaching experience. Would that be a fair summation? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not abandoning what we're trying to teach them. You know, I'm not sort of saying. Um, I mean, I, again, I'm not talking about rugby all the time, but you could go to the physical literacy project. You say, well, it doesn't look like rugby. Mm. Well, actually, but you have to look at you have to look through a different lens, mm. and these are things to look through it. So I'm looking at movement skills, decision making. Is there context? Yes, there is context because it's transferable. But you have to look at the experience of those participants and you've got to really be aware of the dynamic of the group. And I think intuition comes with experience and it will, in terms of being able to, to change things and move things on 
but you really need to look deeply at the people you are coaching and the experience they're having. Um, and that isn't at the end, that's during. You know, it's, it's an ongoing feedback, an ongoing feel of what, what is working, what could move on and being successful, but not being led by them in terms of they're not the coaches, but, being led by, but be led by them in terms of what environment you'd want to create that they would enjoy being in. Mm. Um, and I think that the literacy and physical literacy project worked really well because we connected with where they wanted to learn. They wanted exciting children's stories, but one half of me, the other half of my brain, if you like, wanted them to be good at movement. I wanted them to have good balance. I wanted to have good coordination. I wanted to have good footwork. And these are the real things. I wanted them to have those skills for life that when they move, go through their age groups and they go from primary to secondary, which is that transition challenge where they, they move to more complex um, activities, are they prepared for it? Now, the children at this age of five, six, and seven, are, I mean, they're, they think they're on a pirate ship. They think they're looking at treasure. They're octopuses. And, and that was a way to reach down to them, what I felt was important to, I wanted them to have a, a really enjoyable experience, which connected to what I wanted them to learn almost subliminally. So I think it's about, you're right, it's not being child led, but it's certainly having a greater consideration of what that environment, that experience will be like. I think, um, it chimes really closely with something. I mean, uh, the fundamental movement skills element. I've I've had some challenges with um, c- certain members of an ac- of the academic community who've who've been championing the fundamental movement skills uh, approach, and you know, I've got no problem with that at all. I'm entirely entirely supportive of you know allowing children to experience the joy and pleasure that comes with learning to learning to move i think it's you know it's in i would say this because i've worked in sport all my life it's it's at least as if not more certainly in in the in the context we're currently with the some of the health crisis that we're currently facing um i think it's it's at least if not uh, more important than you know reading writing um you know arithmetic however the approach that was advocated around how we would um, expose or allow children to experience um, learning about movement was very prescriptive, very um, almost, you know, the fun almost seemed to be removed. It was very kind of, these are these core movements that you must master in order to be able to perform, uh, you know, sort of at a later stage and kind of very much from a kind of talent and performance perspective and, Mm. and very, uh, mechanized almost whereas what you're advocating for me which is you know kind of l- learning about movement through exploration but using you know kind of um almost like dramatical narratives as a means by which to um foster the children's imagination to then ele- enable them to engage within a game but still learn about movement that's so much more well i feel anyway that's so much more powerful mm-hmm. and and really connects children with um, you know, it creates that whole sort of situated meaning, which I think is um, will, I think, get them much more engaged in the movement context as opposed to, oh, this is sport. It's about repeating movement patterns ad nauseum. And for me, that's just not the great. That shouldn't, shouldn't be how we introduce sport to children. Well, the, I mean, that's, that's it's ex- in, right. That, that chimes exactly the way I'm thinking. You know, how memorable can that be? This this tick box list of I can do a forward roll, I can handstand, I can do this. It, you know, it. It, it shouldn't be that prescriptive, and that's the word you used. It, it shouldn't be about we can do this, then we can do that. You're looking at a dynamic movement environment. There very often is, we use the word dynamics because you have the, those variables in that game environment where we need to suddenly change direction backwards, forwards, jump high, land on one leg, both legs, we might fall over. Can we retain our balance? Can we catch on one hand? Those one handed catches the cricketers take on the boundary and pull them back in field when the ball is going for six that's not born of coincidence that's born of a whole pattern of uh, a whole process and pathway of movement skills being refined and developed in in a multi-dimensional way and um i i know which i'd prefer to learn mm-hmm. um i would like to learn in a you know i know my british judo they have a, they had a module which was uh, animal games it was learning movements you know, by bringing animals into that implicit learning environment. And I remember that distinctly in a, in a presentation. That's where we have 
we can bring that into a much more exciting way of teaching movement skills. Um, and it, again, it comes back to context. Where is that? Where would I use that in a, in a game and an activity? Can you relate that to it? Uh, and I agree with what you're saying. I think sometimes it's very prescriptive with no context. Yeah, I mean the context, the contextualized bit is definitely something that I'm I'm keen to dwell on. Um, where do you think it comes from, though? I mean, I'm I find myself sometimes in in debates. Probably get get I've, I've tried to stop getting trapped into debates on Twitter because I think it's a brilliant. I don't think it's a particularly brilliant format for it, but mm. but I do like I do value it for the opportunity for to create discussion. Um, but um, you know, where do you think it stems from? why you know why do people get hooked into the idea of we must do enough reps of a movement in order to create mastery because i think some people struggle with the idea that i think they kind of conceptually grasp the idea of learning through games or learning through play and um all that sort of stuff but i think they struggle with the idea of yeah but what if by doing it that way they don't achieve the level of mastery that might be necessary for a future uh, life in um, whatever level of sport so from that kind of almost that sort of talent development mindset and that is a driver for a lot of people but where do you think it comes from what what's the what's making people think in that way well I think it's what's what's still hanging over our head is the 10,000 hours rule mm. that, that you know I think that's most people not I see most people I'll rephrase that Many people will remember that and they'll recount the 10,000 hours. But you have to remember the 10,000 hours rule, if you like, came from playing musical instruments. Mm -hmm. uh, and it came to that individual practice repetitive over and over again, which was okay for that domain. But we're in a different domain. We're in a dynamic where sport can learn across. Um, we can coach skills by broadening the, the menu they have, bringing in different activities. Now, if you look at some Olympians for, that have got gold medals in two different sports, rowing and cycling is a classic example, uh, they, they didn't apply the 10,000 hours rule to one and then 10,000 hours rule to the other. They just have those deeply embedded skills they transfer. They transfer the learning process, the application of what it is to be to achieve excellence. But I do worry about the everything is measurable phrase mm. um yeah because i mean this is one of the areas i've been talking about play you know how do you measure play well okay why don't you look at people just look at <laughs> what behavioral indicators they're giving you that shows they are playing enjoying it and what are they doing when they're playing they're, they're problem solving they're collaborating there's no hierarchy you know, if there's a hierarchy it's a hierarchy they've made up where i'm king of the castle but i'm not king of the castle all the time so play environments are they're not measurable. And it's an, uh, other than looking at it and saying, I notice these things happening. When it comes to um, sport and sport performance, here's an interesting conversation I had with a, a, a friend of mine, Steve Greenfield, very experienced coach. He's a coach in Winchester. And we're talking about, the coach said to me, um, I don't know how to put play into a swim set because I only have an hour and I've got to do 4,000 metres. So I spoke to Steve and I said, do they really have to do 4,000 meters? <laughs> is it that specific that if you do 3,750 <laughs> and use the time they'd have taken to do a little one minute double game before they start to engage them to have a bit of fun, would they be 250 meters per session per week, less competent by the end of that year? And would it affect their performance base? Or might you actually use that 250 meters as a really engaging motivational tool between sets? And he did say, well, it's not a magic number. <laughs> um, I'm not having a, a criticism of swimming in, in any way, shape or form. So please don't think that. I'm just curious about what does training and practice look like? Um, is it that finite measure? And I think that's, I think people are very driven by the 10,000 hours. But if you look at its origins, again, it is from, from musical instruments and not from sport. Plenty of athletes out there have kind of broken the rules to show that 10,000 hours is, is not really where they've emerged from. It's interesting, actually. I mean, I think you're right. I mean, although having said that, I think we were doing repetitive practices before Ericsson's research came out, but I think it kind of has cemented it. And the bit that's, I think, so 
talk about memorable things 10k hours is memorable isn't it um i mean he's obviously been at pains to try and um you know go say you know it's not a rule it's an average and all these sorts of things but i think the shame of what's happened with that piece of research which is i totally agree it wasn't based on a sports context and actually you know you've got to be differences depending on sports i mean sports that have less perceptual variables for example and nobody else to deal with so let's take it you know cycling and rowing you know cgs individual cgs sports um you know there's there's less to uh, to, to attend to i'm not saying it needs any lesser degree of uh, skill or training or whatever it might be what i'm trying to say though is is that there are there are differences in sports in terms of the various things that somebody has to learn or attend to and therefore um i think there's got to be differences in domains between the amount of the amount of time the amount of time it might take to reach to reach an elite level and i'm not necessarily saying time in terms of hours of practice but just just time and experience but um uh, the bit that's been lost it, because we've got this fixated on this this average number um, is that actually one of the things I think I really liked about Ericsson's research is it was the, the key message for me was firstly to get good at stuff is hard. <laughs> yeah. It generally takes a fair amount of time, um, whether it's however, you know, it generally takes a fair amount of time. And the third thing is how you practice is really important. Quality of practice is really important. Yeah. His definition of deliberate practice lends itself to certain domains that require that you just have a basically you're just miserable through the entire experience of it <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, like music yeah. and dance. I don't still still don't think it has to be that way either, by the way. But that's just by the by. But um, I I and I've always challenge the idea that you know you need it needs to be not necessarily or inherently fun because i've always thought that the sports experience is slightly different to that however the idea of quality practice quality being important so it doesn't really matter whether you do it's not not doing ten thousand hours of something it's ten thousand hours in his mind of something of a degree of quality right so let's forget the number let's just talk about the quality thing right how can we expose young people to the best quality experience possible and start from that perspective and then work out how many hours it might take based on their own human capabilities at a later stage that should be the discussion that we have um and it feels to me anyway with the work you're doing on play and all that sort of stuff that actually that's the focus it's the qualitative endeavor isn't it more than the amount of time we do it yeah absolutely it's not volume you know, Chris Boardman, the cyclist, was a, was the w- real innovator in taking away volume and th- looking at quality from a specific example of of quality over quantity. Mm. And I think Mark Foster um, in swimming you know, advocated the same. And his his event was the 50 meter freestyle. That was his event. And some of the things that emerge from this 10,000 hours. You're right. It's this. You know, the word used is miserable. Mm-hmm. Well. You know, you're not selling that sport to me. If we're, if we're going to do some miserable, you know, my, my practice sessions are going to be miserable. But when we look at quality, and I agree with you entirely, you know, there's no particular time. If you observe somebody deeply and measured their performance, you say, okay, three minutes, that's fine. Let's stop. Let's have a break. Or 15 minutes, let's have a break. Then this is where the play element or or off, off intensity can come into it you know my my partner she you know she talks about living life in 70 mile an hour and 20 mile an hour zones you know drive, don't drive around a town that's 70 mile an hour you get in your car and some are 30 some are 40 some are 50 and so on and that's how we should you know it's structure our practice that when it's 70 mile an hour it's full gas and it's intense and we want quality but after that there's a 20 mile an hour zone and that's not just physically that's cognitively you know, because it's not the body isn't just this machine that can perform for a, a period of time. The brain is also, you know, full gas as well, concentrating, making decisions, but performing, you know, the, the activities over and over again. And we need to be considered in that approach. And that's where the swimming aspect came in for me. For example, just just thinking, okay, well, let's break up the sets. Let's just have a, at the end of that set. Let's just do something different. Recover. Um, and it, what I what, in preparation, I suppose, for today and, and some of the notes I, I make when I read the books, you know, looking at the science of successful learning, um, number one, mix up your practice. Um, just vary it. You know, that we know that our experiences in life, we like to be varied. We don't watch the same TV program over and over again. We, we like to, to experience different things. Mm. Um, 
And also that practice structure where you look at blocked practice or mass practice. Also, what comes with it is this, what's called rapidly forgetting. Mm. Um, but actually, if you, and there's something I'm going to do on Sunday, is where I'll give an activity, walk away, do a different activity, go back to it. And I won't say anything other than just say, I want you to repeat what we started. And when the learner adds effort to that activity, when they actually have to put an effort in to recalling something, that, that effort required to recall it deepens that learning process. Because they've got to recall, oh, okay, what do we do? Let's remember that. And whilst it might not be immediate, the fact that they are fully engaged in, in, in that learning process by having to, to recall something through thinking, talking to others, what do we do? That's right, okay. That would affect deeper learning. Yeah. So the science of successful learning is, is you know, is a very broad, actually quite simple. But uh, when you go to about quality of practice, that's one of the things that, in the concept of deliberate practice and elite performance, we look at in- engagement, isn't it? So the individual isn't uh, performing mindless repetition; they're engaged in the in the activity because they're trying in some way to solve a problem. I mean, there's a very simple exercise like that i might be giving away your uh but this won't go out before you do your session anyway but i might be giving away the the, the task which is just reading a line of text isn't it you can either read it as it is or if you take certain letters out it just becomes much uh, a slightly more difficult cognitive task which then means that people can recall the actual words far better it's as simple as that isn't it that's that's exactly it how much effort are you involved in the learning process so rote learning Mm. it's simply the parrot on the pirate ship yeah. repeating what's been shown to you with not an understanding of why I'm repeating it. Yeah. Um, and, and so when you're designing you know, your practice setting, that's the challenge you want to set people. What did we do last week? Okay, you know what we did last week. Um, off you go. I, I spoke to John Fletcher and some other coaches a couple of weeks ago, and we spoke about player-led warm-ups. Um, and it was very interesting because I used, at the Edinburgh conference, I had some, they're called yoga pretzel cards and they're individual yoga activities in a pack, like a pack of cards, laid them out. I got two coaches said, right, choose six activities from these yoga, the, this, these yoga cards, six each, which six you choose are the ones that are most appropriate to you in your preparation for an activity. There's only one that they overlapped on. Right. And I said, does that tell you that we need to individualize warm-ups, trust players to have some autonomy on what they choose? Yes, there's a need for the, uh, the team sports to come together. But th- then you're also challenging that learning because you're indicating them what is what is good for them. They've selected a warm-up that works for them. It's interesting, you know, because this relates back to what you said earlier on about the swimming in the 4,000 metres. There's quite a lot of cultural conventions in sport, aren't there? Mm. Um, so, for example, warm-ups, team-based warm-ups. A lot of them are just rituals. And I find it I quite often challenge, particularly when I'm doing stuff around children's, children's like coaching children in, say, hockey or whatever. Mm. And I talk about, I always get the adults, coaches to sort of I say, right, go and, can somebody lead a warm-up? And they'll usually do the fairly standard one. Um, and I, you know, I always, I actually make a bit of a joke of it now, you know, and you've probably seen it a hundred times because everyone's doing dynamic stuff now, aren't they? Because apparently that's, like, that's the way to go. Mm. Um, and, you know, and they're shooing the chickens and they're opening the gate and closing the gate. And then they're, um, you know, kicking the donkey. And, all these sorts of things. <laughs> and it's like, I just watch this all happening. And then afterwards we come back in and I go, right. So, and then usually I'll get three people to do it. And, and the second or third person does something that's a bit more game-like. Mm. And then I asked them the group, I said, which of those was the most enjoyable? And they always said, well, that the game one was definitely most enjoyable. And I go, so why do we do the other one? And it's interesting how resistant people are because it's like, well, I need to do that. Well, why do you need to do that? You know, all the evidence is suggesting it doesn't really help you with injury prevention. Um, no, but I just need to. I feel like I need to. Oh, OK. Is that just because it's habit and it's, it's sort of part of the experience or is it? And it's, when it comes to children, though, I mean, like how many kids, you know, before they go out to play at lunchtime, you know, go through an elaborate stretching routine before they go to play, you know, and, and then come in from lunchtime, you know, how many injuries do they get? You know, they just don't. 
So mm. it's really unnecessary, but for some reason we feel like it's something that we have to do because it's like it's a good practice and it's the way children should be taught. And and going back to the four thousand meters again, you know, he he doesn't know why it's four thousand meters. It just is. Mm. That's just what the way it is. And I was talking to Alan Rapley at the conference about this, and because he he's working in coach development, working in lots of different sports, that he doesn't have any knowledge of. And he said one of the things he can bring, even though he hasn't got any technical knowledge of the particular um, domain itself, is is to ask questions about certain things, like working in rowing. Why do the why do the rowers warm up in flip flops? And they're, they're warming up in flip flops because it's easier then to get in and out of the boat and everything else. But it's not a particularly good. Um, item of footwear to warm up in mm. but again the coach had gone i don't know that's just what they do <laughs> <laughs> that's the way it's always been done <laughs> exactly that's so what we've we, always done that's the ritual so when the overt coaching remember we mentioned about what it looked like from the sidelines mm. there's an expectation that people who are watching a session would like to see certain things taking place yeah um, because that's what they have seen on the television or other activities or experience themselves and i'll always say this what's the first thing that you do when the whistle blows to start a match? Mm. And there's a bit of a pause and they'll say, run, jump. And I'll say, no, you make a decision. You make a decision. So well, let's make a decision and I'll warm up. Mm. You know, you, you think, where do I go to? Who do I follow? Who do I track? Whatever that specific thing is in your activity, dive off blocks, um, accelerate from blocks. Um, whatever it is, you have to make a decision. And how much of your warm-ups are decision-making based? Um, so that's, rather, fascin- that's fascinating, so, actually. Sorry, that's fascinating because I think you're right. I mean, I, I look at a lot of so-called, I mean, warm-ups are designed to be preparatory for performance. Mm. So, um, you know, and so in my mind, you're right, they should be getting people in the best state and i i always find it's what's fascinating you, know, you quite often you know, lose a game or something and you're doing a bit of a review afterwards and people talk oh we didn't warm up well enough we didn't warm up well enough but you know what i found really interesting is and I've, sometimes i've actually deliberately done this like i've been on, on the way to a game and we got like caught up in traffic and we're late and so people are literally putting their kit on and running straight onto the pitch to play and we start brilliantly every time and the, the times when we have an hour and a half to prepare and warm up and everything else and we do all these different things, all those sort of things, we then get start the game and we're just nowhere near ready for it. Mm. And it's largely due to the fact that we're, we're doing this ritual. It's become mindless. No one's really cared. They're actually chatting about other things and not even getting any way mentally prepared for the game. And as a result, surprise, surprise, we don't actually perform that well when it comes to the actual game. And it's definitely something that's vexed me over the years. Mm. I mean, that's... That, that's... That's so true. I often wonder why I had to do a 45 minute warm up before a, an 80 minute game. When it got to the last 20 minutes, I was, you know, <laughs> barely able to, to, to walk, let alone to run. And it, and it was, I, I think it's, um, it's a little bit like when I used to go out and, and drive. My dad would tell me to, and don't forget to do this and don't forget to do that. Mm. And I'd just go out. I'd say, yeah, okay, okay. And I often think it's a bit like coach doing things for their reassurance to make yeah. sure they've covered everything. So they've got yeah. to do line outs, got to do scrum, whatever it is in your particular sport, got to do this, got a list of these things to do because they want to make sure they've covered those things before they start to play. So my dad's covered all these things before I leave the house to go and drive to, to college, wherever, at least he said those things rather than know that they are kind of second nature to me. So how can we condense that time? We talk about quality of practice can we do a quality of a warm up? Yeah. Um, and and what does that? What does, again from the outside lines? What does it look like? Because you know a lengthy warm up, skills can deteriorate. You can go into the, into the performance with a negative mindset because something's gone wrong. Whereas we need to have a real assurance that preparation is not really uh, individual because it suits me. I can perform better now because I've done that. But it's also really focused on what we're doing. And again, is there an is there a perfect time for a particular warm up? Yes, there's a, a, a and a time to, for for muscles to to retrieve the core temperature needed to perform activities. But what does a an appropriate warm up look like? Yeah, I, I see it all the time. I go to hockey festivals, you know, under tens, and you see all these coaches leading groups of players through these, you know, elaborate calisthenics. Um, and I just throw a load of balls out off you go and just let them have a play 
Just, just go and play. We're gonna have a match in a minute. Just go and play for now. Knock it yeah. around. Play. Do what you want. Do some moves on your by your own, but by yourself or with a partner or three or four of you. It's up to you. Off you go, and you know. And then we just go and play. I just think to myself, you know, it's like I just I've never never quite understood. Oh, and by the way, like in, in hockey as well, when we're doing these warm ups, we haven't got our sticks in our hands. We haven't got a ball with us. We're just going to do all these stretching movements because that's apparently right. that's that's preparatory. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You uh, mentioned. And, sorry, on, sorry. No, 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 I was just going to say uh, one of the best warm-ups I've seen is somebody doing a before Hampshire under 16s final. It's a long, a long time back with my old uh, friends, Ollie Rogers. You know, he, his pre-match war team. They were playing uh, frisbee. Brilliant. Um, that was how he coached. That's the players knew that they were comfortable with that. The other team were looking across, going, "What on earth is going on?" Absolutely. Uh, you know, they knew that they knew what to do. They they worked together all season. Um, it suited them. Yeah, to to be like that. Yeah, um, you mentioned uh, a minute ago um, the, the overt coaching. I know we've talked about this um, fairly recently about this whole thing. I mean, I know a lot of people who are listeners to this podcast, and I've had guests on as well who have uh, who are challenged by this, which is the perception of what coaching should look like, um, and if somebody who's an observer, or actually somebody who's an active participant doesn't necessarily see or receive what they perceive to be what good coaching looks like, Mm. then they sort of feel like either something's wrong, they've been shortchanged, what have you. And I know Steve Hooper came on from Inclusion Coaching and he has this challenge constantly with parents who um, he calls it the perception of Mm. non-coaching, which is where a very cleverly designed activity rich in learning experiences is taking place. Coaches are literally observing and, um, you know, and, and waiting for moments that might be, that might have meaning enough to be able to ask questions and to, and to uh, provide, you know, kind of coachable ideas. Um, And, and how a lot of people are viewing that as well, they're not doing anything. What what are they doing? What they're here for? You know that kind of thing. So I'd be interested just to explore that whole area with you a bit. Um, I, I've heard this quite a few times, and I think that um, the reference we spoke about overt coaching was me watching a, a, a program which my daughter's watching a pro, an Australian TV serial about a girls' football team, and the coach is there with this, you know, very very uh, instructional, uh, very sort of telling, um, very evident that he is the coach. And I, I'm just looking at it thinking this isn't this isn't what coaching is like. This isn't this new generation of participants shouldn't be experiencing this. The new generation of coaches shouldn't be looking like this, mm. but it's done for the audience. So, Oh, that is a coach. Now, one of, th- I know particular order, but I do think that one of the things we need to really be aware of is that we will have someone's child in our care. Uh, and what I would say is have a dialogue with the parents at some point that says, what we're trying to do today is this, and you may see me standing and not doing X, Y, Z, but what I'm looking at is their ability to problem solve. And so when we review it at the end, at 50, every 15 minutes, or when you just discuss this with the children in front of you, we want to celebrate the fact that I gave them a problem they, and they, they solved that. Mm-hmm. And that dialogue with a parent kind of gets them on board. They end up, they're looking at that activity with a different lens. So the effort to have this real collaboration with child parent coach is is that that's that real teamwork is that real communication because the the parent we're looking at thinking well it's not what i experience it's not what i'm paying for but they're not and not necessarily understanding that learning process so one of the ways that i demonstrated it was um with a group of coaches where i bought uh, six packets of lego the cheapest ones, I have to say. Um, and they're all the same. They just build a little mini car um, and there's a couple of things added to it. So I said, right, three of you, um, th- there was three groups of three and they all had a coach. So it's two working on the model and one coach. And the other groups, the three other three groups of three, just go on with it. I set a stopwatch and I said, right, just let me know when you finish it. And uh, the, the, two, the, the two participants had the coach. The coach couldn't get their hands off getting involved they wanted to point direct build and it was a real irritation actually for the other two and the other three who were just left get on with it um achieved the time 30 seconds quicker 
than the coached group. And the coach said to me, you didn't do anything. I said, I did loads. I was here if they needed me, mm. but they didn't need me. Such was the relationship I'd had and built up between the participants, the players, athletes, and myself was that they were confident doing that. They wanted that challenge, but they knew that I was there. Mm. The other group said, he never let us get on with it. He was interfering and these are adults. Mm. So well, what's that feel like as a child? Mm. And I wrote um, a, a blog for um, a working with parents in sport. Um, and it was about watching my daughter go climbing. She climbs. I'm there if she needs me, but she explores. She stretches herself when she feels confident. She, she makes those decisions in that environment, but all the time knows I'm there. And it's trying to change that culture. You know, John Fletcher always said that if every time I make a decision for a play, take that decision away from them. Mm. So I suppose in something I would say, look, coaching looks differently from what you may have experienced. Yeah. Uh, it's Sorry. interesting. It, no, no, it's, I mean, the, the thing about that as well, the, you've just made me can think of something else, which is, uh, by the way, I, I love the fact that, you know, creating the dialogue, I think that is, the, that is the key. And as, there's a lot of coaches in, in sports who I think are almost seeing parents as a, as a problem, as a threat. Mm. Um, mm. Certainly, I think, I mean, in football, they even have the, the respect line. And I I'm, I'm, have a slight concern that the respect line is part of the problem because coaches on one side of the field, parents are on the other side of the field. There's a, na- there's a barrier form between them anyway. They have no idea why they may or may not be involved. And I, I, I definitely feel like, I would not like to have an adversarial relationship with parents at all. I want them to be part of the part of the experience. I mean, they are, they are participants, aren't they? And, and they deserve to have as good experience as possible. And often they're there and they're not causing problems necessarily because they're, um, they're, uh, you know, malevolent or, you know, malicious. They're there because they, they're there because they're emotionally uh, involved in their child sports experience. Mm. Um, whatever motivations they bring as far as that's concerned. And actually, I think we, if we don't engage them in that experience and involve them in that experience as, as participants, then it's no surprise that then challenge, you know, we may get some sort of challenges later on down the track. So I'm a hundred percent with you on that. But one thing I found quite interesting and just going back to your point about uh, what John said about the coach kind of making the decision for the player. It also, this also happens quite subtly as well, and I'm not sure how many coaches are aware of this, which is when the coach is giving off signals to the players. They may not be overtly making decisions for them, but they're giving off subtle signals, either through their questions. So, like, you know, there's a favorite question sort of after somebody's done something, which is, you know, how could you do that better? So mm. that automatically suggests that the coach feels there's something that needs to be fixed here and the player needs to find the answer to that and then we go through this horrible question and guessing game it's very painful for everybody involved Mm. and I just wonder whether more of our focus should be on understanding what the player is experiencing and what they're aware of and by understanding what they're aware of we can then begin to dial or what's the word I'm looking for we could refine their attention so that they begin to pay attention to the things that might help them to solve the problem as opposed to suggesting to them that they made some kind of a mistake and there was a better option and can they verbalize a better option to me and if they can verbalize it then job's done I have done my job as a coach and I'm interested in that very subtle play that's happening as well around right and wrong, good decision, bad decision, all those sorts of things. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's a preloaded question. There is obviously something wrong with that performance. And actually, when my coaching students come to do a session in the first year, they definitely change in the second and third years because it's, we kind of trade a better culture. The first line to me is, I could have done that better, couldn't I? Mm. Um, mm. Now, that's come from somewhere. Yeah. The second years and third years, I've understood kind of the way that I work and try and ensure that that, that they change habits. And one of the questions says, what did you notice? Mm. And that, that, that there's an aspect of noticing, which is the concept of looking at things and not directing someone's eyes to what you've seen, is they may draw something out. It's the double card coming back in again. It's almost mm. like the circle complete. 
I look at that card, I notice a dinosaur, and I think of, you know, what, what my fears are getting old. But somebody says, what, did you, what would you change from your past? They'd mm. notice something different. Mm. And by offering that question, what did you notice? Mm. Uh, it's very interesting what they will have drawn back that you didn't see. Yeah. And when I go back to the literacy and the physical literacy stories I've done with the children, um, again, I'm not, sounds like I'm selling products here. I'm not at all, but these are really engaging stories and learning experiences that we, we've all had. Mm. The Pirate Crunch by Johnny Duddle, if you're not familiar with it, I read the story and I read it again. But my daughter had already noticed that it was the, the puppet operated by the octopus. So it was yeah. the bad guy in the whole thing. Yes. I didn't yes. know that. Yes. And yeah. she noticed that from page one. Yes. My kids did exactly the same thing. <laughs> yeah. So what am I looking at? I'm looking yeah. at the bad guy at the end. Yeah. I'm not looking deeply at the story. Yeah. And so the question is, what did you notice? You know, if me and you went to see a James Bond film or, I don't know, uh, a, a film, doesn't really matter. What we noticed about that film is, could be the same, but it could be very different. Mm. Um, and uh, oh, I didn't notice that about that character. Oh, well, right at the beginning, they did this, that and the other. But if, I'd, if I kind of load the, my narrative with the question, then you're really going to repeat what I've seen. Mm. Wasn't it good when he did this? Mm. And you can only re- you can only repeat that. So noticing is a really interesting thing, and um, that takes me down another rabbit hole about uh, pick a mix. But that's a, that's a, an important story um, about uh, players and and child development. But yeah, I think noticing is very important. So just think about the question you ask somebody: What did you notice? It leaves it open for them to honestly reflect and give you an authentic reflection on what they've seen. Yeah, there's no value laden attached to that statement, is there? That question, there's no yeah. value. It's just you literally say, I, "Just, just tell me something." The only, the only way I've always said this to groups because you quite often get players who just like don't want to answer the question or whatever. But I've always said to them, you know, the only way you can answer that question incorrectly is not answering it. You must have noticed something. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Um, you yeah. just dangled a little carrot there. Pick and mix. Tell me more. Uh, okay, so <laughs> it was. Um, I'm hoping to work on the. F- we're running a physio degree at the university next year. I'm really keen to become involved in uh, in their teaching program, just from looking at holistic the, 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 the holistic approach to to um, patient patient care. Mm. And um, this goes back to what you said when you're at Harlequins about those connections with players uh, and those collisions. Um, my daughter is. Uh, uh, we have a, a ritual, if you like, every Wednesday afternoon they want to pick up from school, we go and get a pick and mix, get the bus home. Mm. That's our ritual. It's a kind of nice little time that we have together. And um, I wasn't, I was away work and Nikki said to me, uh, she she went on and on about pick and mix. Daddy always takes a pick and mix. I said, it's important to her. Mm. And she said, said well, I, but when she watched her go to the pick and mix and to carefully take out all these different things, she noticed, yeah, it's really important to her, isn't it? It's not just a grabbing sweets. Mm. There was a science behind it. Mm. So that made me consider, and even more, when you work with players, what's important to them? Mm. What is important behind that performance? Like Nick was saying, give me a non-rugby answer. Tell me something that's important to you. And it could be, let's just look at player, player development in academies. Well, What's really important to me? I need to finish this session on time because I've got to go back and, and practice my saxophone. Mm. So there's something more important or as important as the the sport you're trying to teach them. So trying to find out what's important to people's lives is quite an, uh, an eye opener because it shows that level of of, of uh, care they have about something else mm. and it's important to them. And you might want to really engage with that in some dialogue later on. You know how you're getting on with. Can I leave early because? Yes, no problem. I understand why it's important to you. Now, these aren't specifically coaching things of technical, tactical things, but they're all part of that broader development um, in terms of, of how we build relationships, how we get the best out of each other, find out what's important to them. I think that's, um, and, and it's interesting how uh, quite a few governing bodies, um, or if you included, have tried to even if you let's just take the the sports experience what's important to you about the sports experience you know and trying to understand what the individual is looking is looking for from their experience and then trying to design the experience accordingly i think one of the challenges often is one of the ways in which governing organizations tend to work is they often 
defer to the use of legislation as a means by which to bring about kind of cultural change. Mm. And my fear with that is that that can sometimes backfire because what you get is sort of disgruntled compliance and, uh, and, 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 okay, so it brings about a change of behavior. Therefore, is it a positive thing? Is it a negative thing? I don't know. My point being is, is that you need to get to the bottom of the kind of cultural underpinning that, that, uh, that is creating this kind of behavioral issue, um, that stops us from providing something that is important. My big issue though, when any of this, any of this happens is I've noticed this, that there seems to be quite a, um, uh, a, a polarized sense where certain people, um, parents, stakeholders, whatever, have got a very, very deeply ingrained view of what the sports experience should be. And it tends to focus on an idea around it's about, um, hard work it's about competitiveness it's about all these different things that are apparently going to be important life skills that apparently you can't get from any other any other walk of life apparently um and uh and then whenever there's a move towards kind of like you know a softening of that i i e I want to say a softening of that i mean you know if we know for example that young people don't necessarily prize the outcome of the game as much as they prize the 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 experience of the game so the winning element is less valuable and then an organization comes along and says right we're going to devalue the outcome piece um we're going to we're not going to have league tables it gets a backlash from all the people that are out there saying but children are competitive we need to have competition otherwise they won't be able to survive in life Mm -hmm. i find it really difficult because if you've got that as a kind of uh cultural culturally resilient belief as an adult and you're going to impart that on your children or you feel that that's going to be valuable for your children. If you then present an alternative, you can sometimes get quite a, quite a significant amount of resistance and it's quite difficult to educate that, which is why they, they resort to legislation. Well, we can't educate you out of it. So we're just going to force you to do it. You just can't quite unravel that in my head in terms of the, the best approach. Well, I'm a, I'm a lot older than you, Stu, but I remember being uh, sort of, yeah, I remember being eight years old and told by my grandmother that I needed to drink cod liver oil because it was good for, good for me. <laughs> and after I'd been violently sick about three or four times, she realized that it was never really going to happen. <laughs> um, so I kind of took the medicine reluctantly. It didn't work for me, and I think I've grown up all right. Yeah. Um, and that sport isn't the only, the only channel to develop, com- develop an eager competitive as an appetite for persistence and eagerness and desire to, to achieve, you know, if sport is the only way that that is the only channel where people will learn those skills. And I think people are sorely misled Mm. because, uh, you know, that competitive comes in, in lots of different learning experiences and through your development, um, uh, sorry, sport is, is just one of those channels where, um, you know, people have to be very careful about that because, um, I keep on referring to double cards and again I'm not trying to say it, but it's interesting the love heart in there one of the coaches said to me in the questioning uh, when they would I said what questions did you ask they said um what's your first coaching experience like your first kiss <laughs> what a and weapon. uh you know what was really lovely in the group was that um that every because we kind of unpick the layers and it was a good environment for people to share funny stories there were some people that had that awkward experience that they never went back mm. and the ones that kind of fell in love with it so mm. as a result of it and, and you know what's your coaching experience like i think it's about understanding that we're not removing competitiveness from those environments but we are managing it managing it as it's being this uh, an animal that mustn't take over you know i, I remember russell Lenshaw talking to me like put challenges in change the word from competition to challenge how many can you and Warren Abrahams. Um, you know, lots of little challenges. I bet you can't do, I bet you can't score seven in the next 15 minutes. So I do a, a, did a session with uh, tennis balls and tennis ball tubes, um, again, using the cards uh, and this egg timer. How many can you do? So next time I want you to beat it by three, beat it by four. Mm. Now you're not telling me we're not instilling that drive, that eagerness to get better in people by just shaping the activity so as people can can have a success measure um so 
I mean, I, again, I, I think the problem is people make sweeping statements, don't delve deeper, don't allow the coach to construct that learning environment where competition, challenge, learning, success, empathy, um, enjoyable experiences all form a part of it. Um, every every part of that item on the on the on the uh, the recipe has a part to play. Just that sometimes they emerge a little bit more than others because it's appropriate. Um, so I, I think that coaches should be confident to to use that kind of uh, first kiss scenario. Say, what experience are we giving them? Because this isn't about your experience because you're not doing it. It's mm. about the experience of the purpose in front of me. Mm. And the last thing I want to do is tell my daughter what's good for her. Mm. Or she'll be drinking cod liver oil. <laughs> and that's not going to work. And so I'm, I suppose we're talking to people who are familiar with this because it's their, what they do. But when you're talking to parents, just try and reiterate that, that have faith in that learning experience and that there's not a race to learn. You know, I don't have to learn to swim by the age of seven because everybody else has done it. You know, my daughter rode, rode a bike with no stabilizers at four. Okay. The reason she did it is because when she read, rode a bike without stabilizers, it meant she could go cycling with dad. Mm. That was her drive. But she couldn't swim. Because mm. when she went swimming, it was playtime. Mm. And so it's not a race to learn. But at some point, having faith in the process of, of learning and the environment and the experience that people have, that they will arrive at that level that they want to be at mm. Mm. but uh, like i said um w- we have a generational shift mm. and um, i feel i feel like um i feel like people are well certainly based on the feedback i get from people who listen to the, listen to the show um i feel like people are really bought into that idea or i, I i'm probably and, and i know that i know it's an echo chamber so i know i can be fooled by that but i've definitely mm. had uh, people say to me, this has really changed the way I, I even think about the sports experience for young people. Mm. And they're the, they're the kind of like those moments where you think, yeah, this is all worthwhile, you know, um, because if you can just do that with two or three or four people, however many people you can reach, then um, that, that's a big driver. You, you, you've, um, what you've touched on there is a nice segue into the play stuff. So mm. definitely interested in exploring that more with you because I know you're researching and writing in play. So just what, what's, what, what's going on there? So I developed a, a project called um, I Learned to Play Again um, in collaboration with uh, my third year students who just graduated. And so we, um, on, we start, I wanted them to reconnect with a play experience to understand its value to reflect upon what it felt like to to um, understand the experience again and understand how important it was there's a tendency for them to think that when they coached that i was looking at real measurable technical uh, expertise and and so on so for the first three lectures of last semester we went to a local a, a playground uh, we, we had, we, there's no, no children on it I have to say we didn't bump any children off and we spoke to a couple of parents there what we were doing and uh, we just spent those three hours uh, playing and exploring some various different activities and games and we brought children's stories into it so we had uh, the the monkey bars um, they climbed up along the top and down the middle because the big bad wolf climbs down the chimney at the end after climbing onto the roof so it's a lot of Im- uh, imagined play with a story linked to it, but we were looking at how important it is in our coaching. And so one of the challenges with coaching uh, young children and young players is the perception that play is a waste of time. It's a reward. It's what we do after we've finished. And actually, when you look at uh, the athletic skills model, um, which um, shows um, this division of training time between what could be perceived to be organized practice and and kind of deliberate play, play which has context and purpose, is that as we get older, the play becomes less and the more structured practice, the more what looks like the sport becomes more. Um, and that, that kind of reaches a a 50-50 balance around about sort of 12, 13, 14, and then the technical side uh, 
takes over and the play still remains. Um, now, what that play looks like, what some coaches may think are horrified, what do you mean? Half of that is playtime. Well, it's, it's the concept of play. It's playful activities that relate to the game we're trying to teach or the sport we're trying to teach people. So when we look at play and its value, it, it elicits freedom so people feel unconstrained. We talk about the Brazilian footballers, the Fijian Sevens players, where they are creative and they, they, f they play with freedom. Um, I, I remember the 2006 World Cup, I think, when they spoke to the Brazil coach. They said, what technical what information and what strategy have you given your players? He says, well, whatever I tell them, it doesn't make any difference. They do what they want anyway. Because they, they play, they practice with freedom, they played with freedom. Um, so can I provide activities that are less intense? So we talked about the quality of practice. So we've done a, a tough 15 minutes on this. Okay, let's go and do this activity, which is a more playful, less intense activity. So it becomes the off button, on, intense, off. And you, it keep, keeps that engagement. Um, with adults, you know, there's always a perception that adults don't value play because I'm now an adult and so I should be having adult um, activities that look like that. But in fact, that's as important for us in terms of our engagement, enthusiasm and love of the sport because what hooked us at the beginning was a love of that activity, a love of that sport and we did it through playful activities. As we get older, we should still retain that love of that activity and that's where play comes into it. It's an intuitive feel as to when it's appropriate to put in it. Some people say, well, how much do I do? Is it 10 minutes, 15 minutes? When do I do it? It's the intuitive approach that says, great time to warm up. A great time to do after a period of hard work. Great work, guys. Let's just go in here and play that lovely game you played. Um, I've spoken about this before when I was uh, doing a play session with uh, London Irish under-16s. Um, just was invited uh, in January of this year. And I said, if you could do anything now, what would you do? And they would play American football. Right. And they went and play American football. <laughs> they they had the rules. They had no bibs. They had the space organized. Uh, there was no conflict. Uh, and they played that with full intensity. Um, and so, you know, play, it has tremendous amount of value in terms of learning, um, getting people to work together, enjoy the experience, um, Retention, we talk about retention, don't we? This continuation desire. I like going each week because. Um, and again, with the, the coaches, I shan't tell you which, which workshop it was. Others might remember it and think that I'm going to sort of name them when they were flying around as butterflies. But it is, it is still within our, it is innate in people. It's more dormant in adults than it is in children, as it, should, it should, shouldn't be dormant in children. It should be part of their expression, who they are. But when adults re-engage with play, they view the coaching experience very, very differently. And it becomes less coddler royal and more kind of appetizing. It, it's uh, fascinating to me that, I mean, we're, we're having to have this discussion. I mean, you know, you, there's, that fa there's that kind of favorite meme, isn't there, about, you know, play is the work of childhood. But um, I'm not quite sure if that really works. But anyway, I, I sort of take the, the message that they're trying to get towards. But um, it, it feels to me like the opportunities for play are becoming less and less uh, available. So it's certainly physical play. So, you know, most people are bemoaning the, you know, the rise of the, you know, the, the video game, whether it's handheld device, you know, my little boy plays video games, plays Fortnite and this, that and the other. It's one of the few, and, and lots of people are complaining about these games being, you know, enormously addictive. I'm not surprised. It's one of the few times when they can genuinely have creative play with their peers, you know, chatting away online at each other, working out strategies, working out solutions. There's no parental involvement. There's no adults telling them what to do. They're literally finding their own ways and they're sort of negotiating with each other for the use of different tools and resources. And, and I think... I've, I've become fascinated by by video games as a means of as a means of kind of guiding the way we can shape the sports experience because there's so much so much there that can um, can help. I mean, you'll be aware of 
James G's work. I've had um, Amy Price on, who's very influenced by his work around the use of, you know, video games as a means of learning as well as as well as expression and play. But my view about play is also based on the idea that, and I like the way you framed it, which is, um, it's it's a bit like um, so if if you dial up the intensity and you dial up the you know the performance element, then then obviously the opportunities for expression or certainly the perceived opportunities for expression and creativity become become a bit more reduced because the performer beca- has a little bit more anxiety towards successful execution of whatever uh, a thing they're trying to do. So it tends to reduce it. So you create a space in there which says, actually, here's an opportunity where expression and creativity are our priority. And therefore, we expect you to be ex- you know, trying and exploring and creating opportunities and doing lots of different things. You know, or not even we expect you to. Just, just do it. You know, go ahead. Because uh, there's, no, there's nothing on it. You know, you can, this is where we lower the intensity to give you the space. Um, and I like that. And I was sort of made a note to myself of sort of saying that, you know, we talk about like whole part whole as a, as a way of framing a session. But well, what if you do intense, less intense, intense, or, you know, kind of performance, play performance, not to say that performance can't also be playful. And that's, I think the goal, but what I'm trying to say is, is the way you can shape and almost create your pick and mix within your session. That's a nice way of framing it, I think. Yeah, and no, I, I think if we we're, we're talking about children uh, you know, at the moment, and, and or the, 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 let's say we are talking swift about children, we talk about adults as well, where there's a perception of play equals child. Um, I did some work with Scottish Slime Canoe uh, with Doug McDonald, who's uh, you know, he's, he's a great advocate of play, and uh, so I, so I flew up there, and the skeptical the skepticism was, how can we? These are the elite end performance. How can we put play in there now? That sort of white water environment is tough. It's intense. Um, I'm wanting to say to the coach, I want some of that time to play around. And so we just had experimented and we ended up with um, uh, the beginnings of an idea of that each part of the course, which is divided into three, was like a golf course. So the top half was par three, the middle half was a par four, and the bottom half was a par five. Nice. And the number of gates there, you had to try and get, you know, at least below par or a birdie or, you know, um, match the course record um and that was the it was purposeful it was context there was a coach watching who wouldn't be able to say oh but that's a waste of time and what we started off with because i just sort of sat with my feet dangling in the water with two empty tennis ball tubes thinking i'm going to use these somehow i'm not quite sure i can do so he shoved them down the life jacket of the first uh, uh, of the first uh, canoeist and i said just go in there a few gates come back with them full up and so what you've got is that rotational movement uh, around the around the the gates going underneath them. So you've got a lot of movement patterns in the boat, which are specific to the sport. Mm. You've got the challenge. So he's got the challenge of coming back with a mouth full of water. Um, and so it's the beginnings of of opening that door that play can be really contextual. And that can be a break from the intensity of of training, but still have value. Mm. Like those seventy mile an hour, twenty mile an hour zones. Mm. Um, and what we wanted was to to also have some collaboration. So it's important that the, the kayakers, the, the canoes also had, had um, their own ideas. Mm. What would you do? What mm. would you like to do? Like the London Irish players, we want to play American football. Mm. So it's beginnings of these different ideas. They went into the gym and we did some playful, you know, played in the gym, some real functional training. It was different from the more linear training they've had. Um, and what they, what we, we, we set ourselves three three goals. We wanted progress is taking us forward in whatever way you want to think about that. We're progressing because we're more engaged. We feel more energized. We feel more involved. Ownership, so it's the time when the coach isn't prescriptive. It's the time when we can add to the session. We love this game. We love the golf game um, and enjoyment because you know being at the high end of sport, as you said, in you know, that word, <laughs> miserable. You know, I'm, I'm sure, I don't know a lot of elite athletes tell me it's been miserable, but there's a perception of there's hours and hours of training, probably not always enjoyable. Um, but if there's an opportunity to make it enjoyable, then that is that off button when we're on a lot of the time. It, it, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I love that concept, though, of, um, you know, kind of 
play. I mean, I, I've got this idea, this this concept that I've had in the back of my head, and I, and Martin Tom's helped helped me create it. So I do have to credit him for this, which is because I was always always felt like um, the concept of deliberate play, John Cote's idea around deliberate play, you know, almost as a kind of juxtaposition towards deliberate practice. Mm. I like the idea, but there was something about deliberate it being deliberate that meant it felt less playful. So I wasn't quite. But I did like the idea of play as a means by which to explore in order to um, try something else in a kind of slightly more performance context. So I've been playing around with this idea of play paration okay. um, as, a, as a means by which to say that we're, pl- we're being very playful. We're having a really opportune to play, but we are playing as a means by which to uh, help us with something else that we're going to be doing later. Um, and I, I use that as a way of sort of defining how in a coaching context. So I had a debate with somebody long about free play. And I said, well, in a coaching session, I don't necessarily feel all that comfortable with entirely free play um, because I sort of feel like that um, as part of a coaching session, there, there's, there's an element of purpose. We have a we have something that we're striving towards. I'm not 100 percent sure about this. I'm still exploring it. Um, uh, and I, but and I think free play. I, I just think free play should have a place in any child's life. Um, and I want it to feel as free as it possibly can. So the parameters are very very loose. Uh, the only parameter is uh, it's linked somehow to the purpose of of our activity that afternoon. So yeah. you you can play, you can explore. Let's say, for example, I was working on something around, for example, uh, how we might carry the ball, dribbling, whatever it might be. Go and play. Go and play with your friends and do whatever it is, as long as it's got lots of dribbling in it. That's the only rule. Mm. How does that fit? Well, the four... Um, so we set ourselves four parameters which, are, which guided our play um and and again it's that conversation with the parent care conversation with a skeptical coach conversation with a skeptical athlete like i'm a high performing athlete do i have time to play what what does it what does it look like so we set ourselves these four parameters one was sport specific so there had to be elements in there that you know if you're doing hockey or tennis you wouldn't then go and maybe jump in the swimming pool mm-hmm. okay or or mm. um is there any form of transfer of learning? Mm-hmm. So is there a reaction time in it? Is there a balance challenge in there? Is there um, a coordination challenge? Is there a pressure challenge? Mm-hmm. Um, do, you know, pressure is making... So, I mean, when we play double cards, for example, is that visual search strategy? Mm-hmm. You're looking, you're looking, you're looking for the same thing and then then you feel the pressure. So you can actually have what I call safe pressure. Mm-hmm. So it, it, learning about the struggle to make a decision and... Uh, under a pressure situation, which is a safe pressure. Mm. So no one gets hurt, no one loses, um, but you feel that. De- so developmental exercises, we're doing this at the moment, and then I put the word stretch. How could you do that? See so if you could go longer or broader or wider or with one hand. So the simple way we're doing it was getting back to that playground experience where they all had the tennis ball tubes and the tennis ball. And the simple thing was throw up in the air, catch it in the tube. Mm. okay kids game loved it undergraduate game loved it okay make it make it harder stretch yourself so then they were throwing it throwing it to each other and catching it Mm. they were doing it with a non-dominant hand they were doing a 360 whilst Mm. the ball was in the air Mm. now when we sort of delve deep into that we said what transfers learning is from that into a particular sport Mm. because if you're going to use play it can't be arbitrary. It's got to be this deliberate play where there are the four key things. It's specific to the sport you're doing. as a transfer of learning. It's developmental. So this is the only time I can try that. Okay? I try in training. Wow. I mean, Gaza's goal, uh, Paul Gascoigne's goal against Scotland, 1996 European Championships, flicks over the head of defender, scores in the goal. You, know, you tell me that's the first time he's ever done it. I doubt it very much. Mm. because he said there's some freedom in in his environment he's been able to learn mm. and stretch it's probably the first time he's ever done it in quite that way in quite that context but he's probably yeah. Done it <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah yeah one of the play i mean i remember you know the the, the sort of genius that is danny cipriani and, and people are saying oh he does that all the time in training mm. you know you just see it in the match 
you mm-hmm. think he's just pulled out of the bag, does it all the time. <laughs> because he's given that ability to just uh, what could perceive to be messing about. Let me just make sure I've got those parameters sorted. So sports specific, transfer of learning, developmental and stretch. Yeah. Play the four. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. And they are not, you know, the ones that guided us when I was with, with, with Doug up uh, with the Scottish Slalom Canoe. They, those guided us and they still guide us now. That um, what we we looked at was whatever we created, it had to fit that parameter. Brilliant. I mean, that, that for me is almost like the definition of play paration. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Mm. Um, yeah, I love it. I love it. Uh, look, I could talk to you all afternoon. Um, <laughs> and sadly, my day job's going to get in the way because I've got to jump on oh. a call with, uh, with a colleague and, uh, and do, some, do, do some actual real work. Um, not, not that I'm doing this during work time at hey, all. Hey, this, is, this isn't just play time. This has been an hour and a half of playing double, you know. <laughs> well, I've just won. Why you weren't looking, I've just won, by the way. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, well, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Um, uh, listen, I've absolutely enjoyed every last second of, of the time that's literally just flown by. Um, I, I mean, look, I know there's going to be people here who are desperate to try and find out more, get in touch. Oh, oh actually, before I do this, I have to do this. Sorry, there's a question. Uh, Nick Wilkinson, yeah. who you will probably know well. Yeah, Nick. Um, lovely orange, orange beanie. Uh, Nick underscore Wilco underscore uh, yeah. on Twitter. He actually, uh, yeah, he did ask me, he says, can you please, in brackets, genuinely, Ask RC whether he truly comprehends the massive and significant effect he is having on sports coaching in the UK, especially in hashtag grassroots rugby. For example, musical chairs without music or chairs was a hashtag magic game changer at the hashtag kids first convention in 2018. So tell me about musical chairs without music or chairs before we go. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Nick. Uh, you know, you're you're such a good guy. You you are one of life's great enthusiasts, and um, I bet the people you coach kind of get that projection of that energy. Um, and uh, yeah, he, I, I remember ringing him up and explaining to this game which he'd heard about it. So musical chairs without chairs without music. Um, okay, so you're trying to build a scrum, or you're trying to teach the squat position, or you're trying to show people about real creativity the importance of games are inclusive so on normal music and chairs people are eliminated with this one you couldn't be eliminated you had to then collaborate so basically um i didn't have any music so i had to just sort of shout stop so the players run around and jump around when i shout stop they have to sit on a chair obviously there's no chairs so they have to sit on an imaginary chair so the first learning is how's their squat technique so, you, so I, the two halves of my brain, the the playful part is having the fun with this imaginary game, and the other part is, have you got a good squat technique? So I'd walk around and just check the chairs, just see if they were safe enough to sit on. What I pretended that it was a it was a furniture shop, and oh, I don't know if I'd buy that chair. It's a bit wobbly. Its legs are a bit wobbly, and uh, they'd understand then the concept of a good stable squat position. What in rugby is called the tower of power. Yeah. Um, and then I would. Uh, chuck a ball to somebody, shout stop, the person who got the ball, they'd lost their chair. Remember, it's not an exclusion game. Yeah. So I said, what are you going to do? So they'd, they'd have to sit on one of the chairs that were left. <laughs> okay. So um, that was a challenge because there's a balance challenge there, but there's a trust element. Um, but they could also then develop their own way of doing it. So then they decided to bind on like a two-man scrum. So you've got a two-man sofa. So you teach the bind, you teach the bit of collaboration. There's a bit of creativity because they just did back-to-back chairs because they lived in this funky house that had chairs that were back-to-back or they sat on a bus that had uh, uh, seats that faced back-to-back. So you've got that good... Uh, have you ever seen the back-to-back squat where you bind arms? Yeah. Um, and then gradually you just remove the chairs and what ends up happening is you, you can't have any more than a three-man sofa uh, so straight away you've got a three-man scrum mm-hmm. um, with whoever you want, and we don't want to be, we don't want to put people in specific positions early in their development, um, because we don't we want they want to play multiple positions um, in those early uh, early years. But from a context outside of what procedure you rugby, you get the good squat technique, you get imaginative play, you get trust, um, enjoyment. There's no hierarchy because there's no one's no one's lost um right at the end of it all the chairs have gone 
and there's a photograph I've taken where they ch- that what ends up happening is that they have to sit on each other. So they are a chair and sitting on a chair. Um, and it's a great exercise for uh, just team, team building or a great warm up act- activity. Um, f- there you go. Fundamental movement skills, physical literacy, the awareness of balance, mm. um, the awareness of, of that core position, which, you know, the, the, the squat forms the basis of so many of our sporting games. And it's sometimes very difficult to teach. Yeah. So, um, you can teach the, teach the beginnings of the front row in 30 minutes. Fascinating. I love it. You, you made me remind you, you just made me think of a game that I often play a hockey game. Cause obviously being in a relative squat position is quite important for hockey as well, being low down. So we've played a warm up game for quite some time. So based on the idea of stuck in the mud, um, but I play stuck on the toilet. So if, right. you get, if you get tagged, you have to basically be sat on the toilet with your arms in the air until right. somebody comes along and pulls your arms down, which is basically flushing you, and then you're free again. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> the I, I, the lines. I think I'll magpie that one. <laughs> well, you pay me a great compliment by saying hey, too, too much cod liver oil, probably. <laughs> done it. Exactly. Exactly. Um, brilliant. Look, um, that was that's a great way to round off the uh, the conversation. Once again, I'm massively appreciative of your time for coming on and, and sharing. I mean, what is only, I imagine, a thimbleful of the stuff that we could have talked about. Um, but uh, I appreciate that. I know people will want to be able to either get in touch or find out more. So uh, what's the best way for them to to reach you or to at least sort of, you know, kind of stay abreast of the things that are coming out, particularly the book, which is due out in due course, I suppose. Yeah, so it's with um, a colleague of mine, Professor Alison James, and I have a chapter in, in the, the book, which is about using play in, in higher education um, as a, as a, a way of, t- of teaching a, a but teaching tool i suppose i'm massively under underselling it now but um um so we are great playful uh colleagues um in terms of the ideas we put in our teaching so they can contact me either through through twitter through um um, a direct message um or they can just send me a message that people can read and i can send them articles are written or links or they can send me an email at the university which um is actually on my twitter profile richard.cheatham at winchester.ac.uk um hampshire rugby conference this weekend i haven't given away too much um <laughs> yeah listen I, i'm more than happy to share the ideas and the resources that i've got um book lists um, i don't want to kind of bombard people with books but there's ones that you and i like the power of moments see that's a great there's a collision she's you yeah yeah there you Back go three in the same book <laughs> um and I highly, uh, having having listened to you speak on several occasions, I, I highly recommend anyone who's out there who's who, who's got a group of coaches who think they could benefit from some of these concepts and have a, an amazingly brilliant experiential learning experience. Then, by all means, um, you know, if I know you're busy, but if he, if they can get hold of you, then I, I would I would recommend that um, because it will definitely add value to their learning experience that they're coaching. Oh, thank you, thank you very much, and uh, you know, thanks, Nick. That was very kind words. Um, but again, you know, thanks to you for somehow making me feel so much better for what the hat incident up in Edinburgh. <laughs> it's been a, been a pleasure to you know talk to you this morning, and, and thank you very much for for inviting me along. Great stuff, and um, and uh, keep up the good work. And um, I think in a little period of time might be worth reconnecting on here and uh, and seeing what's what what's now you know and having a different conversation about different topics and uh, exploring some different areas if you'd be willing to oh yeah definitely i'm sure there's things that we could still we can take forward and, and the next step so is there, i think for both of us and for many of the coaches out there it's, it's watch this space definitely yeah. richard once again thank you thanks have a good weekend to you thank you cheers Thanks for listening to the Talent Equation podcast. If you like the show, then please consider supporting it by leaving a review on your favorite podcast player, telling your friends about it, or even becoming a hero and show your appreciation by becoming a patron. Just head over to thetalentequation.co.uk and click on the Becoming a Patron button at the top of the page. So there you have it great conversation that time just absolutely flew by um like i said um richard should have been on this show a long time ago and uh, it was brilliant to catch up with him and to arrange your time get the diaries liaised and then be able to uh, to pick
picked up. Um, I've worked with Richard in the past, we've presented at the same events and I've spent time uh, yeah, seeing him in action and as I said earlier, I highly recommend if you ever get the chance to work with him or to go along to one of his, uh, somewhere that he's speaking at or, or one of his seminars, it's, uh, as you've probably picked up, it's a highly entertaining um, his, uh, period of time that you will spend and you will definitely come away learning, scratching your head, thinking about new things. So definitely one, one to see. I uh, wanted to put a big shout out to uh, some people who've come on board as supporters. Simon Robinson and John O'Connor have both joined as, uh, as supporters, so uh, you're getting a, a virtual fist bump from me. Um, and also Bruce Freeman's joined. Uh, he's he's, he's decided to take the brave step of joining the Conclave. And uh, Bruce, I'll be in touch soon to uh, give you your jo joining instructions. Uh, in the meantime, everybody else, uh, if you want to get on board, by all means, please do. Uh, all, all proceeds, most welcome. Um, but uh, as well as that, uh, please consider leaving a, a review on iTunes and let other people uh, find out about the podcast and hopefully get some learning from it as well. Um, in the meantime, I hope you have a great week of coaching. And remember, ditch those drills. <laughs>